All right, so this thing's recording, just so you know, Chris, this is going to record the whole webinar. So we'll have that and I'll send it to you afterwards. So uh, welcome everybody. I want to welcome you all to another ESA online surf course. This one is about surf strength training with Chris Mills. I'm excited to welcome Chris of Surf Strength Coach. So thank you, Chris, for being with us. He's coming to us all the way from Australia. So I believe it's what, nine o'clock tomorrow on what? Thursday morning? 9 a.m. from the future. Yes. Okay. On Thursday morning over there. So thanks for being with us this morning. Chris is going to be discussing ways that uh, we surfers can stay in shape for surfing while we're not being able to surf regularly, especially with this whole thing going on as a lot of us are stuck at home. And we were just talking about all the beaches that have, are still closed for surfing in, on the East Coast. So um, he's going to give us some good good insight on things to do. Hopefully you all had a chance to download his free app that we suggested you download prior to this evening and hopefully you had a chance to go through some of that and see what it's all about. Um, Chris, we wanna thank you for offering all your expertise for us tonight with the ESA family. This is, this is really a treat for all of us. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you get started. I'm gonna mute myself. If you have any questions, just let me know. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll take an hour plus and kind of just ramble and give you guys some insights into things you can be doing now. Um, this is largely going to kind of be open format. So I'll chat for a while about a subject, open it up to Q&A. So feel free, ask away. Generally, those questions and answers, that's where the good stuff is, the tangents and the things that you guys really want to know. Um, so Without much more rambling on my end, let's just dive into it. Um, and again, thank you for taking some time out of your evening, because your evening there, and um, learn some things to start applying. So, let me get this screen share going. <clears throat> so, you guys may or may not know who I am. Um, my name is Chris Mills. I run surfstrengthcoach.com. And like Michelle said, if you haven't grabbed the app, go for it. You don't need to do it right this minute, but just type surf athlete into Google Play or the App Store. And a lot of what I reference in this talk is in that app. And then there's other stuff. And we'll give you guys some coupon discount code. Um, so without further ado, I don't know if this... Thing is going to keep getting in the way. Let me see if I can minimize that. The little screen thing is going to get in the way. Okay. There we go. Okay, so ultimately, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer that your health is ultimately your surfing. And all of you guys here now are suddenly at a point where our output has changed. Um, our health is somewhat in flux because I look at health as multiple components, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, nutritional, um, biochemical, and, and ultimately our ability to surf and do it well, the foundation of that is our health. And I say this coming from a point uh, where I do a lot of rehab and I work with people that have somehow neglected their body or been through injury and have lost the ability to surf or lost the ability to surf at their potential, their utmost kind of levels of performance. And so what we're really talking about is just keeping ourselves physically capable. And at the base of that is your health. Um, and so if you look at that bottom right image, I look at that and I see peak level human performance from biochemical, biophysical standpoint. And, you know, ultimately, again, we're in this strange transitionary time with this whole Corona thing at the moment, and the variables of health are kind of shifting. And so these are all just things that you can take into account and start applying to yourself, to your fitness, to your own well-being. Um, so again, I'm Chris Mills. I run surfstrengthcoach.com. Quickly, who I am, like I've been a personal trainer for like 12 years. Um, I'm a licensed massage therapist. I've worked in 
clinics, osteopathic clinics, chiropractic clinics, physical therapy clinics. I've worked with athletes, young, old, rehab, um, some pro level, bunch of amateurs, um, and then a lot of just everyday kind of surfers. And we've been doing surf coaching trips for a long time now. So I do have a pretty good understanding of what it is we're asking of ourselves physically in order to surf well. Um, so what I want to give to you today, again, is a better understanding of how you can align variables to support your health and performance. Because generally people come at this whole fitness thing without an understanding of the outlying variables of true health. And so what it is, is you're on a surf journey, you're on this health journey, you're on this life journey, and things are dynamic. Again, look at the situation we're in and how dynamic that is and how the variables have all changed. Suddenly, mental health is probably different because you're not getting the outlet that surfing once was to you or you're in uh, stressful scenarios, financial stress. So again, all these variables are ebbing and flowing and ultimately, it's up to you to find ways to support your performance in life. And I say performance not in just like high level, but just being a functioning, capable, content, happy adult. And again, what I'm going to give to you today are just more options so you have a better understanding of variables so you can make more aligned choices that help support you for the remainder of your life. So the whole um, lead a horse to water thing, I'm going, I, I, I'm not giving you like some standalone fitness program. So I think a lot of people at first were probably thinking they're gonna come onto this and do some like heavy hit workout or something like that. More so I want to give you a better understanding and insight from my over a decade in the field and working with a lot of surfers of things that you can and should start implementing, especially now that we've got a lot of time on our hands, we might not be surfing as much, we're able to start training um, and want to do so efficiently as possible. This is my YouTube. I'm gonna reference this a lot so you can find a lot of like follow along tutorials on my YouTube channel. There's so much follow along kind of fitness in general at the moment, but I will refer to this a lot. Um, so easy to find, YouTube, search Surf Strength Coach. This is from the free app and within it, again, if you go to the app store or Google Play, just search Surf Athlete. There's that whole free surf training program. Use it as much as you'd like. I'm also going to talk about foundation training and there's free tutorials of it within my app. And then we'll also reference some other um, programs within that. So really good resource for you to start using. And again, it's all just about learning more options uh, that you can start applying. Okay. Again, like we talk about health equals surfing. So <clears throat> ultimately what we're trying to do is improve the foundations so that we are more capable of higher performance and Generally, people only come at this through fitness, but really what we need to look at is thinking, nutrition, movement, sleep, hydration, and breathing. If you've ever heard of a guy named Paul Check, really smart fella, these are his six found foundations of health, the fundamental principles of well-being. So whereas going towards fitness or performance or surf performance, people generally think it's just this kind of fitness training aspect. I would probably say what's more relevant is the other aspects of health, the thinking, nutrition, sleep, hydration, breathing, especially at the moment if we're going through mental, emotional challenges, financial stressors, a lot of unease, we really need to look at the thinking, the nutrition, the sleep, hydration, the breathing, and make sure our movement isn't just some intensity, high-level output if the other variables of health and supportive nutrition and well-being aren't really in place. So this is what I'm talking about when your health is your surfing. Uh, take a, a broader perspective of what true well-being actually is because all these things play a really big role in essentially keeping you capable. So if we look at high-level surfers, it gives us a better perspective, I think, of what we're asking of our body. 
and look at those positions, look at the hip ranges of motion, look, think of the speed of the torque, um, the forces being applied through the body or being produced through the body. And if we get an idea of what high level surfers are doing, it's easier for us to get an understanding of what we're asking our body to do. <clears throat> and so that's what I talk about. Again, this is like high level performance and your body is a system of systems. So it's not just a bit of fitness, it's fitness along with the nutrition, along with the thoughts, along with everything else that ultimately influences the, the human system. We're going to start with mobility. And this is pretty much the number one issue for a lot of, especially males, um, over 30, the whole mobility. And I say mobility rather than flexibility is because mobility is the ability to control a joint through range of motion. So flexibility is like if you lay on your back and I can push your, heat, your foot to your face. So like we're stretching the hamstring. It's just passive, right? But can you muscularly control and lift your foot to your face? So do you have control throughout that range of motion, that mobility? And our body's a stacking of joints. If the knee's not moving well, the ankle's not moving well, the hip's not moving well, et cetera. And we've got some major movement points that um, we really need to start looking after as surfers, and that's gonna be spine and hips. So we're gonna go through some spine and hip stuff here. Think of those as like two major movement crux uh, centers within the body. And once those lock up, other parts of the body start to having dysfunction. That's not quite the right word, but if a hip doesn't move really well, a knee or a low back is going to take the brunt. If the thoracic spine's not moving well, a low back, a neck, or a shoulder is going to take the brunt of it because, again, it's this kinetic chain. One joint influences the other. So again, looking at a high level surfer, um, we can get an idea of the movement requirements. Look at these hip joints, look at the spine positions. Again, think of the torque that's going through the body or the force being produced or the force a wave is imparting upon a body. And if, again, we just get a representative idea, we can get an idea of what the things we're doing with our fitness is supporting that or the lack of things we're doing is supporting it. So again, older surfers, I work with a lot of guys kind of 35 and onwards that can't even move like this on dry land and wonder why their back hurts um, when it's surfing or when they're surfing. Um, so I can't actually click on Q&A stuff and more when I'm in this full screen mode. So what I'm gonna do is get to a point where we'll take some questions um, in just a few minutes and I'll back out of this full screen. Uh, so this skill pyramid, this is what we call a skill pyramid. I think this is really important because surf fitness has become quite a thing in the last couple of years. And we professionals like myself often see things that don't make any sense because people are trying to replicate the skill in the gym and that that's not training. So your skill sits atop of this pyramid that's built on performance and movement. So your skill, your sport specific skill is practiced in the water video filming, technique work with a coach, um, even some of the Carver skateboard stuff, that's working on fundamental skill patterning. What that sits atop is your body's ability to move well. So that's movement. And I would also say, how's your breathing? How's your thinking, your nutrition, your sleep, the fundamentals of health. If that foundation is eroded or small, you can't put performance on it. So performance being endurance, strength, power, speed, quickness, agility. Those are things we can train for in the gym that I'm gonna show you today. That's what surf fitness is. So generally speaking, if you're looking on social media and you see some like really gimmicky surf fitness thing, it's probably not actually that beneficial. Um, and that'll make more sense as we go through the training that I show you. So just, I, I want you to have a better lens to look at things and to kind of filter information that you see out there. Cause again, this surf fitness thing is exploding. Um, so understand skills practiced in the water on land. We make sure we move well and then layer on strength and endurance and speed and power so that we can more, more optimally get into the water and work on the skill without a limitation. The, 
mechanics of a golf swing are actually very similar to some mechanics that we need as a surfer. <clears throat> so if you look at this, it's high speed, high level rotation. And you can see rotation going from foot all the way up to the skull. And so when we were talking about mobility, like look at either image and think of how that movement would be restricted if a hip couldn't move or if a spine couldn't rotate that whole swing would become really wonky and quirky and probably be shoving torque and force into a joint that would start to degrade into a road. And that's what we're asking of ourselves in the water is to be able to move very dynamically with high speed, high levels of efficiency and fluidity. So we need to make sure mobility kind of precedes these other things. And this is what's kind of been happening to us as humans. And again, especially at that top level, like if you've been binging Tiger King, which is insane on Netflix, but all these seated postures, they're, they're essentially the antithesis of what we need out of our body. So three primary movements within surfing are leaning, compression, and twisting. So if we get an idea of the positions our body needs to be in, and the joint segments influence that, we can get a better idea of what it is we need to work on. So that's what I'm gonna give you now is we're gonna start going after hips and spine. Um, <clears throat> before I do, let me click here. Any questions? What body part needs most range? Actually, we're getting into it. So think of a cutback. Um, I'll go big screen here um, for Caitlin, and then I'll get to Bill's question. Uh, so if we look at this kind of cutback, and let me go bigger screen here for a moment. So that's John John on the bottom. Predominantly, he's kind of in a squat slash lunge position, and it's mostly hip range of motion. But then I, I can't use a cursor here, I believe. I don't think it's showing up on your end either. But if he fully whipped that back around, he'd open up that left arm and swing that rear arm through even further. So he'd be like rotating even further to his left. So again, some of these two major movement centers, we're going to keep going back to hips and spine. Your hips should have about 40 to 60 degrees external rotation and anywhere, to, depending who you read, 30 to 50 degrees of internal rotation. And your spine through the thoracic spine should have pretty extreme ranges of rotation. And when those can't happen, it's going to force torque into a low back or a knee. Um, and we'll, so we'll very momentarily get into some stuff for hips and spine. And then Bill, in your experience, are the beneficial topics to reflect on or avoid thinking about, say, the half hour before going to sleep? So, yes, I will get that one towards the end. We'll get into sleep. Um, biggest thing, stop looking at screens. Uh, like, if, if you want to, some of those blue blocker glasses, like the blue light blocking glasses at night, if you are watching screens, wear those. But for the most part, it has to do with your synaptic... Um, it's SCN, Supreme Neoclasmic Plasma. It's, it's, it's this brain thing that I'm, I'll think of it in a moment. Um, don't watch screens. So a bit off tangent there, but we will get back to that for sure. It's a good question. Okay, so lean compression twist. Primary movements within surfing. We need to make sure we can get there with ease. Start with the spine. So you can see that top image. I don't know how to get rid of this top thing. I think it'll go away again. Um, that computer posture is the opposite of what we're asking of our spine. You can see bottom image. Um, once we start coming out of, posture is not quite the right word because it's kind of gotten abused. Alignment, when things aren't as in an ideal alignment, um, forces going through the body don't get dissipated as well. So. Here we'll start looking at some videos. Oh, my cursor's back. This is from my app, cool. And so I think this is from the Surf Athlete Program, but what I've got here is a peanut. It's just two tennis balls taped together. You should all be familiar with this from this point forward. I've got some, within the free program, there's some foam rolling um, videos as well, but tape tennis balls. If this is too stiff, you can just use a yoga mat rolled up to about the diameter of your wrist, or forearm. And what we're going to do is reestablish the ability to extend the spine into our thoracic spine. So I'm pretty mobile now. 
But for a lot of people, they can't even tolerate those tennis balls there. So you'd be using a yoga mat rolled up. This is something that can be done daily. Literally a daily practice of some type of stretching. If you are old, if you are above 30, you should be doing some type of stretching, flexibility, mobility work every day, even if it's only five or 10 minutes. All the clients I work with, it's kind of insistent that you get to this um, and start imp implementing these protocols. And so all I'm doing is kind of mobilizing. It's basically a self-mobilization of what a chiropractor would do to you. And again, if you can't use the tennis balls, use a yoga mat. And I'm not going to go into detail of each one because, again, you can find all these references within the app. Um, and some of the more advanced programs, but we need to get that spine moving. This is in the free program, not this exact video, but you will see this is a segmental cat cow. Cat cows are legit. They can be done every day and should be, but if you notice, I am moving one segment at a time. This takes time. And if this part of the spine can't move well, then you're not going to be able to get into extension. Cool. So take the time to learn. Again, it's details are in the app. Learn how to do a segmental cat cow. Um, one of the best things you can do for your spine, along with some other things that I'll get to in a moment. So in up down, it's just really slow. It's really intentional. Usually people can only move here or only move in their neck. Um, I'll get to the chats in a moment. We need to incorporate rotation. So this is a kneeling thoracic spine rotation. If you've been to physical therapy for a spine or neck or shoulder injury, you've probably done this before. Get into some type of spine rotation stretching, whether it's like a thread the needle through yoga, um, anything that elicits rotation into this upper portion of the spine, because just like it stops moving when you can't do a cat cow and we're trying to get it moving with a tennis ball, um, if it loses rotation, so again, think of the rotational centers for a cutback, it's hip and spine. So if those two major movement centers can't rotate, it shoves torque into the low back or a knee. And that's why you see so many knee, low back issues with surfers and golfers, because these parts of the body are starting to take all the load because the parts that should move, the hip and spine, aren't moving any longer. Um, Spider-Man stretch. It's in my app. If you don't know this, it's Google world's greatest stretch. It's within my, get, get familiar with it. This back knee could also be off the ground for more advanced version, totally fine. But see how it's working on range of motion of the hip joint as well as the spine. This is a good stretch that even if you only did this and the tennis balls at least, what I've shown you so far, most important, tennis ball, segmental cat cows, and then get into these. Cool? That could be like a four minute stretch routine and then you can get back to your Tiger King method show. Um, really, really, I do this one before I surf every surf. Um, last thing quickly, and then we'll get into some questions and I'll get into lower body and upper body. I can't overstress enough the relevance and importance of your spine and spine health. A happy spine is a happy life. And anybody that's gone through severe spinal pathologies before knows what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the most easily applied and beneficial aspects that I have come across is foundation training. All the, the text at the top says foundation training if you can't see it. It's across the top. This is a founder. It doesn't look like much if done well it is hitting so many beneficial things because if you get the hips and the spine doing their job, the, again, you can't, I don't know if you can quite see that at the top. I don't know how to get rid of it, sorry. Chris, uh, Chris yeah. you can see the top. Okay, cool, so you can see what I'm seeing. Yeah, Perfect. we're seeing the whole slide, so everything's good. All good, so what we when i mean axial skeleton basically spine and ribs cool if we get those doing their job really well the shoulders start to behave a bit nicer the knees start to come into a better alignment the hips start working the way they should be working so foundation training like slater's used it dane reynolds has used it like a lot of the dudes on the north shore use it um and it can be integrated into your life daily very easily there's free resources of this within my app. And then the foundation training boys have some resources as well. 
Um, I've been certified through their protocols for years now. Everybody I work with, with neck, shoulder, hip, or back pain is doing foundation training. And for those of us that don't have pain, this is more of a preventative. Um, injury prevention is actually just training for performance. And this is a foundation of musculoskeletal performance. Um, so I urge you to start looking into this. If you want to hop up on Skype with me at some point, we can get into a bunch of foundation training. But it is really, really relevant. Um, I teach this to people all over the world without getting into more details there. Um, with that, so that's spine and hips for the most part. I'm about to get into more hips, but does anybody have any questions from that so far before I continue rambling? I'll give it a minute to see if anybody needs to type. And if no, all good, we'll get into hips. Hey Chris, I got a question. With those stretches, like the cat cow stretch and stuff like that, how often do you suggest that? Like on days that we're not surfing, would you suggest we do it every day? For sure. So even before you surf, like before you go hop in the water, do some Spider-Man stretches and some cat cows at minimum. And I'm going to show you some other stretches now. So like if you have three or four just really good stretches um, to start implementing that. I personally am a f for all those that I work with, I try to impress upon them that they are familiar to where they could do five minutes of stretching every day. And if they want to do 10, cool. If they want to do 30 minutes, cool. For everybody, that's not feasible. I would like to see cat cows and some foundation training every single day with people because literally all we're trying to do is put motion back in. So for those of us that are stuck at a desk all day or have a lack of movement, it's basically think of it as like a vitamin for your spine. Like it's a multivitamin. It's just putting some motion back in there. Um, for those of us that move really well, we can get away with maybe not doing it every day. But for those that are already behind the eight ball and stiff and have injuries, they need to increase the dosage of that vitamin basically until they can restore adequate ranges of motion. So yeah, probably every day. So like in the app, the free, there's a, in the free training program, there's a mobility session. It, it would take you probably six to eight minutes tops. You could easily dose that every day. And again, we're just looking for kind of for longevity. And so we need to kind of dose ourselves accordingly with kind of an eye on long-term durability. Um, anonymous attendee, what are other daily things we can help to our posture? Foundation training and simple awareness. So if you start doing foundation training, um, you will start to feel what better upright alignment is. And outside of that, it just requires self-awareness. So what I mean by that is I'm sitting at this computer right now and I'm starting to slouch because of gravity. Gravity will always start to put us here. Sit on a couch, gravity's gonna put us here. All I have is a, maybe a bit more self-awareness where I will self-correct. I'll realize I'm doing it and straighten up probably more than the normal person just because I'm more accustomed to the sensory input of being here. So for bad posture, if somebody has posture that's not necessarily ideal, to be done daily is stuff to get your spine to stop being stuck like this and to be more aligned here. So again, those tennis balls along the spine, rotational stretches, cat cows, and then we strengthen it through some foundation training or other positions. So we get the musculature to hold us in this position. Um, all right, I'm going to dive into hips quickly, and then we'll do some more questions. So there's fanning. I think this is a really cool image to just see, again, what it is we're asking of our hips and the loads. And this is actually going to get into single leg training, which we'll, I'll get into shortly. Um, but basically, that front leg is almost like a single leg deadlift. That back leg is almost a single leg squat. And so also think of the forces he's absorbing and having to resist from that water rushing up that wave face into that board. You Google surf strength coach, best hip stretches, it's an older video. There'll be some more stuff coming out soon, but um, I run through kind of a couple key stretches if that's a weak point for you. Here's a video, again, from the app. This is your basic 90-90 hip stretch. It's in that video that I just showed. 
if you think you have tight hips, you need to know how to do this basic orthopedically aligned 90-90 hip stretch. Um, pretty much everybody I work with, except for the occasional female that's really mobile, we have to start learning how to do a really functional 90-90 hip stretch because this stretch is the crux for basically all other hip stretches. Um, here's a much more dynamic hip stretch where it's just a warrior lunge. So if you're doing some yoga practice, all good. You can see the, the relevance that this kind of pulls from yoga. Easily done. This is a really beneficial one prior to surf. If I had to say like your surf warm up would be some cat cows, some of those Spider-Man stretches, this warrior lunge, and then just do some type of like little shoulder warm up. Um, Cause you can see this is hitting balance, balance requirements getting hip extension, getting spine range of motion, warming up this hamstring glute complex on this front leg. Um, this is hitting a lot of beneficial things. That base level 90-90 stretch is for you to start being able to access stretches like this. This is just a more dynamic hip range of motion stretch, but also getting into spine rotation. This is one of my personal ones I always do prior to surfing. You can see we need to be able to access this basic 9090. Um, this is the hip range of motion required for a really good pig dog position. Um, and it's hitting all relevant aspects around the hip joint. This is probably one of the most beneficial hip stretches you can get to. And you'd be surprised at how many people can't get to this position just because their hips are too stiff, too locked up. Okay, shoulders. Let's see if anybody's got some questions. If using yoga mat instead of two tennis balls, should it be horizontal or vertical? Good question, yeah, so you want it horizontal. So it would be perpendicular to your spine. So just like with those two tennis balls, like call it a peanut, there's one of those tennis balls is on each side of the spine. The so same with the, that yoga mat, you, it would almost be like making a T, you know what I mean? So horizontal to the spine because you want we're trying to put input into one small vertebral segment um, really really beneficial drill and if you get pain or if it's too stiff just make the diameter of the yoga mat smaller right so it might be wrist diameter at first and then eventually you could get a diameter and if you're there you can generally start getting to uh, tennis balls um, jazz does scoliosis affect your surfing? It potentially could, depending upon if it's structural, functional, and severity. Um, structural, structural and functional scoliosis, <clears throat> excuse me, is just uh, it's a term for whether it's spine structure, like a vertebral change, or whether there's something coming from the pelvis, the leg length discrepancy, like the femur is longer than the other femur. Um, depends on severity. Is it creating pain upon extension, like holding yourself in a paddling posture. Um, it could prevent rotation. I've got a buddy here at East Coast Australia that has a pretty severe scoliosis and shreds, absolute shredder. Um, so if you have a severe scoliosis, I would work with a really good practitioner to see what ranges of motion you can still access pain-free and then make sure other parts of your body can move really well. So make sure your hips can move really, really well and make sure you're doing everything possible for the spine that's within its capacity. So if it's a really severe scoliosis, you might not be able to do some of the yoga or the tennis ball stuff. You might not be able to do some of the severe rotational stretches. So that's why I say you need to work with somebody, Marina, to make sure your spine um, has the capacity to do that. Most people, if it's not a severe scoliosis, it's not going to affect your surfing. It shouldn't at all, really. Um, okay, shoulders. Huge problem area. Uh, I'd say the majority of who I see, it's back and shoulders for the most part. So basics, know how to rub out the up, up top. Um, I'm just rubbing out my chest area, that kind of pec minor, pec major area with a tennis ball. You can do that against a wall. That's one really good thing to start helping improving posture because if that tissue is overly tight, it's gonna offset the position of the shoulder girdle. Um, if you get some pain while paddling, uh, it could be like a subacromial impingement issue. Generally, if you're having a shoulder funk, 
issue, learn how to do some release work with a tennis ball. That bottom image, you got a strap, if you got a rope, start getting into some fascial stretches. I'll show a video of that in a moment. Um, this is hanging. Get a pull-up bar, get one of those ones that hangs from the doorway, get Olympic rings. This is probably the most beneficial thing you can do for your shoulders. A lot of people can't even hang anymore because the shoulders have kind of gotten so out of whack um, and out of position and fragile. All the clients, again, that I work with, one-on-one, -on -one, they end up getting a pull-up bar just to hang within their house. So they walk by it and they start to hang because what it's doing is look at the range of motion. Like I can easily paddle stroke range flexibility because my shoulder can be there. And this is simply done. Kids brachiate. Like kids are always playing on monkey bars, hanging from trees. Adults rarely put their arms overhead. And so your body adapts to that. So again, somebody had asked about posture. This will help improve posture because it's going to restructure uh, the, the shoulder girdle, essentially, it's opening up the rib cage. If you see where I go through here, I'm going to start going into active and passive hanging. This is what we really need to get to. Um, this is easily, easily done. Hanging every day. Like I have guys that can't get their arms overhead at all without pain. And within two months, they're doing like full windmill arm swings. This is that band fascial stretch. Really great, after a surf, this feels wicked. When we're on our boat trips and we're doing heaps of surfing, I bring some straps and all the guys are doing this after surfs because you can see how it opens up all the tissue around that shoulder girdle. Opening up all of that lat tissue, opening up the posterior shoulder, and then I get to where we're opening up all that chest tissue. Oops, sorry. Too many, hit the space bar too many times. <clears throat> yep, and you can see there. Really easily done. You can use a door frame for these as well. Um, so, again, going back to just looking at what we're asking of the human body, can your body do these things? Does your fitness kind of support that? Um, Stretching protocols, again, found within the app. These are just dynamic positions. This is why I say it's beneficial if you're doing yoga frequently or some type of mobility-based um, work because we need to easily access these positions because like that image I just showed prior of all the surfers, um, we encounter these in surfing, especially if we want to keep surfing long-term and to do it pain-free. Um, again, the skill pyramid, that mobility, that movement, the base level movement and your health is the foundation of your skill in the water. Because now we're going to get into some of the performance stuff, the endurance, the strength, the speed, agility, coordination, quickness. Some things for you to get an idea out of how you can start to, you know, the whole lead a horse to water. What are things you can do for your own self? Think of what we need as surfers. We need bits of power, we need some speed, we need flexibility coordination, we do need endurance, we do need some strength. What are you most lacking, right? So when I work somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I think of what is your biggest lack? What, what is the hole we can fill that's gonna have the biggest overarching effect? Um, so like a lot of guys above 40, they're too stiff. So if we can get them flexible and mobile, that's gonna have the biggest effect. And then we go after some endurance of the upper body. For women, often we really just want to get them stronger. For injury prevention, especially through the upper body, um, stronger pulling, stronger pushing. Women are generally more mobile. It's, it's an inherent female characteristic. There's more joint laxity. Um, so again, you can get an idea of things you can start doing to support your surfing. What is it you need to work on? Maybe it's cardio and endurance of the upper body. Maybe there's some rehab for a shoulder joint or low back. And then you can get a better idea of how you can formulate training. So here's a bunch of strength and conditioning drills, right? These are just functional movements that work on strength and mobility and power and endurance that do carry over to surfing. None of these are overly surf fitnessy, quote unquote. They're just good movements that train the patterns, pulling and pushing and single leg work and leg strength and rotational chopping that carries over again to what we're asking of ourselves in the water. 
So number one thing you can start doing at home right now, heart health and lung health. Um, and especially right now that a lot of people are kind of sedentary, not maybe getting their physical output in the water is this low level cardio. We call it LSD. So not the drum type, the long, slow distance type. Um, this is probably one of the biggest things for long-term health. And so what you can do, find something you don't mind doing. And for a lot of us right now, we're not getting our 10,000 steps. It's kind of a segue. Um, the whole walking thing, 10,000 steps, base level mobility is shown to have such huge downstream health effects. Um, it's not even really zone two cardio. It's just movement. You are a bipedal organism. You are meant to walk. So right now there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of sedentary stuff. If you can get out, just get out, walk in nature, listen to some music, listen to a podcast, the mental emotional impact that could have but also just base level movement I think is really really important and if you're mentally stressed you might not want to physically stress your body through heavy training so there could be a lot of mental well-being benefit from that of just being out in nature <clears throat> and just walking besides that this long slow distance cardio think of it as your base engine of recovery in the surf being able to paddle it's the it's the fundamental ability of your cells to be able to create energy. And you can do this with jogging. I like to jump rope. I box for years, so I like to jump rope. I do a row machine pretty often. You can bike, you can swim. How can we do this low level cardio? And I would recommend at least once a week of this, if not more. The Mathetone 180 method, if you wanna track your heart rate, you can see there how to do that. If you wanna do your nasal breath way, the easiest way to do that is to it's hard to do with swimming, but any of the other things, you get to an intensity, you can still breathe through your nose the entire time. So I will jump rope, add an intensity that I can breathe through my nose the whole time, and if I went harder jump roping, I would have to start breathing through my mouth. So what that nasal breathing only, it's kind of capping your energy expenditure, which is kind of capping the pathway your cells are making energy. Okay, so this is more of the, we call it aerobic energy production. Again, that's this base level recovery. You can paddle as long as you need to energy production. Um, this is probably more important than your HIIT training. This is more important than super high intensity cardio. But the problem is the kind of Western mindset around fitness, HIIT class, orange theory, ah, intense, they're kind of missing the boat for this, which has a lot bigger health implications and positive downstream effects. Um, so at least once a week, as often as you can, just go walk. But then at least once a week, do an LSD cardio session, minimum 20 minutes, preferably 30 to 40, where you're doing some type of output. It keeps the heart rate elevated, keeps the lungs elevated, or doing their job for longer periods of time. Cool? Every day, not every day, at least once a week. Biggest hole you can probably fit into your training right now. Now, let's get into lower body. Rad image of Slater where you can see the different hip positions, leg positions, knee positions that the body goes through just in a single turn. And again, think of the forces he's producing and absorbing. So, one really good drill, you can do this at home, if you, even if you have only one dumbbell, and it's exciting, this is a progression of kettlebell swings. It's a pendulum swing. So both feet are on the ground, but I'm really working predominantly this front leg. So you can do higher repetition to build up a lot of endurance. You're controlling it, so it's a really good hip drive, so you're creating power in the lower body, and it's predominantly single leg. So if we think of that Slater picture, there's differing pressures and differing positions between the, the legs, right? We, if we train single leg training, which we'll get to more in a moment, um, it hits a lot of those characteristics without the need for a lot of like equipment. So not everybody has a deadlift barbell at home. Not everybody has kettlebells at home. For this, you just a one dumbbell even if you only have it in one hand. If you had only one hand, you'd be holding it in your right. Um, this is a really good high level movement. All my higher level guys, we're doing this drill fairly often and do, can do this quite heavily. 
you should all implement single leg deadlifts within your training programs. Um, because not only does it work on incredible amounts of mobility, the control, the knee prehab, like if you've got knee issues, we always get back to single leg deadlifts. Me rehabbing, I broke this ankle, uh, or was it this one? It was my left. Um, about a, two years ago, this was a big part of rehab. And then we start weighting them. This movement has so much beneficial carryover to your surfing because of how it's working on durability, strength, and power production out of the lower body. And it doesn't really require much equipment. You could do this at home right now, holding a, a water bottle in each hand, or a jug of milk, or a sandbag, right? Um, here's a single, this is the progression of it. Single leg kettlebell, or single leg deadlift. Really good drill if done well. Easy to do at home, minimal equipment, dynamic lunging. Cool, you can do this for high repetition, build a lot of endurance. You could go for like 20, 30 reps nonstop. You're hitting these different angles. So when I have people do this, first you step to 12 o'clock with each foot, then 11 and one o'clock, and then 10 and two, and then nine and three, and then 10 and two, and 11 and one. And here, if you've got a milk jug at home, you've got a sandbag, you've got a single dumbbell, you can start weighting these. Um, this is hitting these alternate hip positions, spine positions that we find ourselves in a lot. Um, really simply done drill and highly, highly effective. Oh, there's shoulders. Um, if you got any questions about lower body stuff, hit me up. Is that your house? Uh, no, that was a gym I was working in, in uh, when I was living in West Australia. I'd be all right having a gym set up like that at home. Okay, upper body training, and then we'll open it to the format of like training that you can do at home. I'm going to breeze through this so we can get to the end and open it up to you guys. You should all be crawling. Crawling. Oh. Bring the knees off the ground. This is way harder than it looks. So this is actually anti-rotation. There's so much core control going on here and so much upper body control. This is really good for shoulders. This is part of shoulder rehab protocols very often I'm using with clients. So like you could do just crawling and single leg deadlifts and that could be an entire workout for rounds. Um, the progression of this is this dynamic crawl position where we're starting to implement more of a push up between. So this is just more dynamic. I want you to be able to do the crawl with the yoga block or whatever else on the, on the low back. The yoga block just gives you sensory feedback of how to stay stable. Um, really beneficial movement, lots of functional carryover through the upper body. You're getting a lot of hip range of motion and hip mobility as well. So this does actually have a lot of carryover. This is an even more dynamic position. Unstable push-ups, whether you are male or female, especially you women, you gotta get to these. If you can't do a full push-up, elevate your hands onto a table or a chair to the point where you can get to full push-ups. Um, I will show you ring push-ups. So again, like how could this be a workout? You could do single leg deadlifts, crawling, and then some pulling that we'll get to in a moment, or stability ball push-ups. So there's less load through the body and you're really working on stability. So think of the pressures that are going through the body during a duck dive. More importantly, if you ever like missed a duck dive and gotten sucked up and over and the board tries to get ripped out of your hands, that I've worked on guys that have had pec tears and shoulder dislocations with that happening. The stability that this works is really helping to prevent that type of injury because you're able to control a shoulder girdle and an unstable surface. Um, and if that's too extreme, you can just go to this regressed version. If you don't have rings at home, that's fine. If you go to my YouTube channel, I have a video of how to make straps using towels at home. Ring rows. Again, if you don't have a suspension strap or Olympic rings, all good. You can then go to that YouTube video of mine that I show you how to make straps with a towel. And this is one of those archetypal movements you as a surfer need to be competent with. It's base level upper body strength for a healthy shoulder girdle that can then go in and just paddle as long as you need to. In progressions, I have a foot on a ball here. 
Lastly, rotation. So core, people always ask about core work. Um, Single leg jackknife, if you can't do it with single leg, just do two legs. Most people have seen a jackknife movement before using two legs. Progress to where you're doing single leg. But the key with this is it's also working on posture. There's no movement, no aberrant movement through my spine. This is a really difficult drill when done well. Ed Bugs, this is in the app. Um, it's, it's a technical movement of learning how to control the breath um, it's easy if done poorly. When done correctly, it's very hard. Most of my back pain patients, hip pain clients and stuff, we all have to get back to this. This is a base level anti-rotation core exercise that is really, really, really like, beneficial when done well. If you got a cable at home, probably not a cable, but some bands, this is a really fun and dynamic core exercise. You can easily do this at home just with a set of bands. Um, without equipment, you can't really replicate this one as much, but this is dynamic hip range of motion and rotational core. So when somebody asked about the big front side hack um, earlier, you can challenge that range of motion and strength with this movement. This obviously doesn't directly impact the skill, like doing these isn't going to make you suddenly shred on your front side turns, but it's challenging the hip, spine, and core in a similar way that get challenged during that movement. That's a really good drill right there. So how could you put this together for yourself, right? So A, you would need some resources. So you can use my app. Um, we'll give you a discount shortly on any of the other training programs. If you go to my YouTube channel, there's follow along workouts. But what's this look like for you? It needs to be altered depending on your life. This, how much are you working, the stress levels, and we need to balance all those health variables. So Monday, you could chill, maybe get a surf in, play with the kids and go out and take a walk and listen to some music. Maybe it was just a stressful day or a stressful previous day. So you need to balance your input versus output. Um, Tuesday, do a stretch routine. You could follow the free stretch routine in my app and then follow a free foundation training routine and then go out for a walk, right? That's not super stressful, but that is really beneficial input to the body. Wednesday, you can do a stretch routine and then a full training workout using some of the movements I've just shown you or some of the drills from the, the app. Um, Thursday, stretch and do some cardio, so that longer, slower distance. Get out, get your heart and lungs doing their job for a long period of time. Friday, chill. You could Tiger King it. Saturday, stretch routine, do some training. Sunday, chill, walk foundation training. Um, Clients are often very surprised at how much I pull back their training and increase other benefits of like sleep, nutrition, hydration. Because generally, if we get our lifestyle variables right, we don't have to train as hard and as intensely as most people think. Um, it just, when we do train, it's really beneficial movements that have a lot of carryover. So for anybody that wants to get anything on my website, use the code ESA surf crew when you check out um, and you can get I think we're giving 30 or 35 percent off any of these programs you'll see other programs within the app so if you go to surfstrengthcoach.com there's there's programs there um, use that discount code and if anybody is hard up hard times with money finances things are really tight I'm happy to accommodate you even further feel free to like flick me an email and get in touch and we can work something out um, this whole physical health is just important as all the mental health stuff at the moment. And it really does go hand in hand and supports one another. So I'm happy to provide options for you if you are financially tight. Questions, I'll open it up to questions in a minute, but here's all my contact info. You can also find me on Instagram, just surf strength coach on Instagram. Please reach out. Like I gave you guys a brief 10,000 foot overview of a lot of info that we could have done like a three hour webinar on, but I just wanted to give you like some basic insight. So feel free to reach out. I'm astoundingly open on all social media platforms. So hit me up with any questions that you need. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and then get into some questions. Okay. Are these programs suitable for young athletes? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think, I, th I think at about the 14, 15, 16, 
can start strength training, 15, 16, maybe 14, depending on the growth. Younger than that, they just need to play. Um, so yes, some of the stuff would be totally, Chad Gallagher, awesome, thank you, buddy. Some of the stuff um, would be applicable, like the stretching. Um, I'd, when I train younger kids, it's a lot more play-based where we're hopping, we're doing carver skateboard training, training we're doing ground-based crawling patterns, um, where it's more play-oriented, hanging on rings, hanging on pull-up bars, throwing balls back and forth, because kids learn best, motor pattern skill development is learned best through play. That's why adults have a hard time picking up surfing at times, because we're so analytically driven, there's not enough play involved. So depending on the growth, I'd say if they're strength training, 14, maybe 15, 16, yeah, can start getting into it for sure. Younger than that, it needs to be body weight stuff where they're just doing push-ups. They can be doing some running, some jogging, some rotational stuff, some hoppings, playing on the stability ball. Stuff. Riley Smith, how long's the class? Um, it depends. I, I don't know which class you're referring to specifically. The free program, like the stretch routine would take maybe like 10 minutes, the training program, maybe 15 or 20. Um, if you start the surf athlete app is like this 12 week comprehensive one. Um, you'll see it in the app. You'll see it on my website, uh, step-by-step -step training laid out for 12 weeks, breath work, paddle training, everything at the start A workout might take you an hour or a little longer. Um, just because you're looking at videos and seeing the movements. Once you're familiar with things, it would take you under an hour. Um, Mario, could you come to Central Florida? Dude, I was supposed to be in Central Florida in May. My family is still like Tampa City area. Um, I'd be keen once I can travel outside of Australia. Um, so we'll see when that actually is. Uh, what else? Anonymous attendee. Are basic workouts like squats good to do or should we do something else? So that's a question that I have to answer that people get irritated with me on podcasts, it depends. So like, is your only exercise a squat? Because a squat's a good movement. But is it challenging dynamic hip positions as much as say, single leg deadlift would or dynamic lunges would? No, it's a bilateral strength movement. You could, so it is beneficial, I'm not saying it's bad, but if a workout is only using squats, probably missing a lot of other things. If you go back and think of those videos or the images of a surfer in all the different positions we find ourselves in, only squatting isn't necessarily preparatory or performance oriented to put the body into positions that challenge those, those hip positions, knee positions, et cetera. So squats are good. Add in ring rows, add in crawling patterns, add in some cardio. Um, I have all my athletes squat, but then we get towards more dynamic stuff, unless like we're using a squat to build strength or we're rehabbing a knee or rehabbing a hip. Um, only ever doing squats, you could probably do better for your body. Um, Maggie, why am I in Australia? I've lived here off and on for seven or eight years now, working um, and living. And my girlfriend, we've been living in Bali for the last two years. And my girlfriend's Australian. And when all this Corona thing started happening, uh, we came back to Australia just because the unknown variability of the situation, we would prefer to be in Australia at the moment than Indonesia. I'm so quite happy and thankful at the moment that we are here. Um, let's see if there's a chat. Yeah, Chad Gallagher was awesome. Thank you, buddy. Absolutely, man. Happy to. Hope you found it beneficial. Chris, um, I have a question. Yes, what's up? You mentioned about the HIIT training. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think a lot of people have been doing around here, like you said, in the Western, over here in the US. That's a mm -hmm. big, big training that a lot of people are pushing. Um, do you still recommend some of those HIIT classes once or twice a week, or is it just better to focus on the longer, slow distance cardio? So. LSD is good. Generally, it should be a base, especially if somebody's doing HIT class all the time. They might already have good anaerobic and aerobic capacity. Um, HIT training is not necessarily a bad thing. 
but for me coming from a world of rehab and injuries and legitimate strength and conditioning, what we see usually taking place in HIIT classes isn't necessary an eye on longevity and durability. It's let's smash these guys, let's not worry about form, let's just beat the crap out of them because we generally as people very driven, we want to feel like we just smashed ourselves to feel like we got a workout. What I impress upon people is to be more aware of your stress inputs and outputs and think, okay, I've been really stressed. I haven't eaten well. I didn't sleep well. Maybe I shouldn't go smash myself in a hit class today. And maybe I should do something else that is a bit softer on the body perhaps and a bit more beneficial input like a longer, slower distance or some foundation training or some stretching, something like that. Hit training is not necessarily bad. I just see people trying to go after that and not having any other health variables really in place. And so we've gotten used to fitness being this hard drive, smash, 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 where it is, it's, it's not necessarily as beneficial as a lot of us have been led to believe through media marketing. Because what has, from strength and conditioning, what has whittled its way down into mainstream media and awareness isn't what athletes are using. It's just what the whole like orange theory, uh, that has kind of become what people assume to be fitness um, and just more really beneficial strength and conditioning needs to streamline down. I'm not against HIIT training. It shouldn't necessarily be the bulk of your training. I want people to just be more aware of when to balance input and output and not just dig themselves deeper into a hole of like, because physical stress is just as deteriorous to the body is mental and emotional stress and nutritional stress and lack of sleep. So think of how's my overall life? Should I balance this stuff with something else today? And is this hit training? Is it putting me into movements and positions that are carrying over to what I want to do in terms of performance? Does that, does that, that was a bit of a rant. Does that answer your question? Oh yeah. Yes. Cause I know a lot of these hit cardio things, you know, with, especially with surfing, you think you want to, spike and then come back down because that's kind of mimics what paddling is when you're paddling out to the lineup and then it totally does at times and i'll put people through upper body circuits that hit that that hit those energy demands it's not necessarily a whole hit class right so like you could take ring rows unstable surface push-ups and crawling do those three drills one after the other and you will smash your upper body in terms of its energy demands and requirements, but the really beneficial movements that have a movement carryover, and when done well, they're really safe to the upper body. And so I might have somebody do three or four rounds of that, and that'll smash their upper body in terms of the work capacity needed for a paddle out. And then maybe we're also doing some type of row machine work where we're doing intervals on a row machine to work overall kind of cardio capacity, um, rather than, just like an F45. And I'm not trying to bash HIIT training or F45. Like I know buddies that own F45 gyms. Um, just trying to give people a different perspective and just a different lens to consider the type of fitness they're subjecting themselves to, and maybe make a more beneficial long-term choice at times. Cool. Um, Aubrey. What should we be eating over quarantine to stay healthy? Oh, that's such a loaded question. Um, we want to support immune system health, which is supporting gut health. And so basically, if you are eating like a standard American diet that is destroying gut health, therefore influence, negatively influencing immune system health, because a large chunk of our immune system is found within gut lining, digestive system, more or less. Um, Eat clean, like eat fruits and veggies, eat whole proteins or vegetarian based proteins, like the less processed. It's such a generic answer I'm giving you, but I can't, nutrition is kind of needs to be very specific. Eat things with vitamins and minerals, fruits, vegetables. Um, don't eat things that you know you shouldn't be eating. Um, those are kind of some of the biggest things. Like I haven't changed much of what I'm doing personally for immune system health. I'm doing fresh squeezed orange juice more frequently for vitamin C. Um, 
There's some things like quercetin has been shown to be an IS-4 to help pull zinc into the cell. Zinc is really supportive of potentially mitigating viral replication, but don't take this stuff from me. I'm not a doctor. Um, I'll post on Instagram a tea, like there's a tea I'm doing. Every day we've been drinking this. I got this from an herbal naturopath. We use some type of citrus peel. So good, clean citrus. Wash the outside if you need to. Eat the fruit, keep the peels, orange, whatever. Um, lemon in a pot, you put the citrus peels. You also put red onion. Red onion has been shown to have a lot of quercetin. And quercetin, is, again, is this IOS-4, which helps pull zinc into a cell. Um, so red onion, I'll put in a couple garlic cloves, I'll put in rosemary, um, and uh, one other thing that's good for the gut, I'll think of it in a minute, it's driving me nuts and I'm not thinking of it. And we'll just, just boil it for like 10, 20, 30 minutes, simmer it, and we drink that. And it's just kind of like an herbal tea that is full of phytonutrients, kind of micronutrients, and just a lot of beneficial stuff that could potentially have antiviral properties or antibacterial properties. Um, we're drinking that just about every day. Um, let's see. Kaylin, when did you first get into surf training? So I started surfing off and on when I was young and then skated for years and stopped surfing, just skated. And then it, the surf training thing, um, I just started doing personal training. Like I started, I was playing like, collegiate level soccer more or less through college and had always been really athletically oriented. And so after college, a lot of surf trips and was bartending. And then I got tired of bartending and started doing personal training. I was about 24, 24, 25. And then that just worked, got into athletic development and then more rehab and then massage licenses. And then that started from the athletic work, started working more and more with surfers. And so the whole surf fitness thing, it's become a thing, but all it is is applying strength and conditioning principles and rehab principles to surfers because we ask some interesting things of our body. If you go back and think of the picture of all those surf positions, we ask the only other things that are as high level demanding is gymnastics, martial arts, and dance in terms of movement repertoire. And so people wonder why, like, their body starts falling apart when they don't do anything that challenges three-dimensional movement or multiple facets of energy production and then wonder why their body kind of starts falling apart in the surf. It's because surfing is really, really demanding. And if there's any weak point, so like a back injury, a hip issue, or lack of range of motion, not enough endurance, surfing highlights that because it requires so much of us. That one little thing's out of kink, um, the whole system kind of starts to falter. So a bit of a rant. So I've been doing the surf fitness thing uh, for a while now, just thinking about how I can relate fitness and training and rehab to my body for the most part and then clients. Um, how old can you be? I'm 37. I'll be 38, Halloween. Any books to recommend for nutrition from Sean? Good question. Um, deep nutrition is really good. I think the last name is like Canahan or Cal, I'm not gonna get that right. Deep Nutrition. Um, another simple good book, it, it's almost a bit too myopic at times, um, but is How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy by Paul Check. Um, he runs the Check Institute. I have a lot of training through the Check Institute, but he does a really good overview of a lot of things I think a lot of people should consider um, for health. Um, Nourishing Traditions is a basically a recipe book. And I don't agree with all of their nutrition paradigms, but basically a revival of a lot of old school recipes that like our grandparents, great grandparents would have used. And there was a lot of wisdom in all those kind of older nutrition protocols. Um, so Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, and I forget the other woman's name. Um, if you can get your hands on any books by Precision Nutrition, um, they have a really good base overview of nutrition principles and uh, getting into the science of nutrition. Um, they run a course, but usually you can find some of their course materials for sale. And you can, that's a, that's a good base level overview that gives people some really good nutritional science insight without being written for 
those in a doctoral program or something like that. Um, those are probably a couple big ones. That gets you reading for a bit of time. Um, Maggie, how do you work on holding breath for big waves? <clears throat> so that's a good question and pretty deep. Um, one is first we'd look at your breath's pattern. Like is your base, do you breathe well in the first place? And we'd look at your CO2 tolerance. Um, you can find a lot of these things within some of the paid programs of my app, within the Surf Athlete 12 week program. But an easy way that most people can start doing at home is CO2 tolerance protocols. Um, so if you just Google that, you can find CO2 tolerance protocols. Wim Hof is not a CO2 tolerance protocol. Excuse me. And then um, when we build some base level CO2 tolerance with people, what I'll have them do at times is do, if we're on a row machine, um, which not everybody has at home, obviously, hold your breath while you're rowing. And so you're working on breath holds while subjecting yourself to high levels of CO2 and depletion of oxygen. You need to be careful with this stuff though, because you could potentially pass out. So it takes a bit of self-awareness. Do not do breath work in a pool by yourself. I actually know of a kid that just died about a month ago in Bali doing breath work by himself in a pool. Um, there's a blog. If you Google surfstrengthcoach.com breath hold for surfers or surf strength coach breath hold, you'll get some blogs written on some breath protocols you can start implementing because it's quite vast. A lot of the protocols that um, uh, free divers use, surfers can use. Um, you can do one where you take a breath in, hold your breath, do as many push ups as possible, and then you, within that blog, you'll find some protocols on how to do. CO2 exhalation and inhalation for oxygen really quickly and efficiently and go back into another push-up round holding your breath. So again, you're subjecting your body to higher levels of CO2 while under output. I would start CO2 tolerance protocols and some free diving protocols of breath holds. Um, most people at first need to feel the suck of holding your breath for a long period of time and then start working on other stuff because it usually it's the mental stuff first. People aren't used to the feeling of I need to breathe. And then once you can calm and relax through that, you can push for like, like my longest breath hold on dry land, I think is four and a half minutes. And at two minutes, it sucks. Not cool at all. I, and any other free diving instructor, you you can just mentally put yourself into a place where you can relax and you're accustomed to the feelings you're going to feel. It's a physical response and you get accustomed to that so you can hold your breath longer. So a lot of it is mental. Most of it is mental. And once you get that down, you can start going to some of the other protocols where you're doing push-ups with a breath hold or row machine with a breath hold and working on CO2 tolerance. Um, okay, cat. Really inflexible throughout entire body. It takes time to work on all the areas with peanut stretches. What's a good way of breaking it down in smaller sessions on days where you don't have a lot of time? Still address everything, but spend less time per area or pick a couple more in-depth training. That's a good question. Okay, so <clears throat> somebody like you, if you are inflexible, if I was working with you one-on-one, -on -one, we'd put you through an orthopedic assessment and see what specifically is tight. We'd then start getting you into pales rails protocols. The FRC based protocol. These acronyms don't mean anything to you, but if you just go, like if your hips are tight, Google hips, FRC, pales, rails, or spine, FRC, pales, rails. All these acronyms mean is it's specific methods, totally research based. This is how we create tissue change. And it puts you through a protocol that specifically elicits tissue adaptation. So making you more flexible, it's, it's basically needing to work out. So it's not just like, let me stretch once for 30 seconds. That's not creating an adaptive tissue change within the cellular makeup of connective mm -hmm. tissue. So what I would have you do is get comfortable doing tissue work to specific areas. So probably shoulder, probably some hip, a couple areas that you feel restricted. And then learn some pales rails protocols for that area. And then learn a couple dynamic stretches. So that Spider-Man stretch I showed, the segmental cat-cow stretch, the hip rotation shin box stretches. 
But your routine would be tissue work to a specific area and then an FRC pales rails protocol to that specific area and then full body dynamic stretch. So you could do that for hips. So like hip day on a Tuesday, tissue release around the hip joint, FRC hip protocols to whatever tissue or range of motion you're trying to improve and then take it into a dynamic stretch integrate that new range of motion to the body. That is how I'd probably tackle somebody like that initially. And then there's gymnastics protocols, kind of not called loaded stretching. We end up probably getting you into loaded stretching protocols in depth for this, but it's basically getting into a stretch position and adding external load. So we'd be like stretching your hamstrings while you're holding a weight plate or something. And that's kind of like strength training combined with stretching. Um, so reach out and I can give you some more resources, um, but that's probably how you tackle that most efficiently. Jason Eastwood, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Yeah, good question. Most average people um, would probably benefit from it. Some really smart doctors I know recommend you should try to at least get 12 hours a day. It's becoming a fad where you're seeing everybody trying to only eat in a six hour window or people doing three day fasts. And those thing, those are therapy based protocols that if you look at the pendulum of nutrition. What has it done the last couple decades? First, it was super low carb, right? Or super low fat, eighties, nineties, super, super low fat, only have margarine. And now we're like, Oh, well that was a really, really bad idea. Now you're getting keto, super high fat, high protein, Intermittent fasting, those things have therapy-based benefits for specific individuals. And we're probably going to come to a point where we're like, oh, some of that stuff wasn't the best. Ideas. So generally speaking, intermittent fasting, beneficial for the average person because most people lose weight on an intermittent fasting protocol because they don't eat as much, first off, right? That's a meal out for them. And they also, if they're doing intermittent fasting, they're probably also starting to clean up the nutrition. There are problems with intermittent fasting. For those that eat too clean and don't eat enough food, it can lead to long-term blood sugar dysregulation. And if you're not getting enough caloric intake or not enough carbohydrate intake, it starts down-regulating thyroid conversion. And down-regulation of thyroid conversion, so your, your liver takes T4 and converts it into T3. That's active thyroid hormone. If that's not happening, it starts down-regulating all cellular metabolism in the body. That can have some bad effects. So I've seen people have some really bad issues with intermittent fasting when taken too far. So you need to look at the overall context of the diet, what you're eating, what your output is. Overall, most people would do well by getting a 12-hour fast probably every night. Every now and then, doing a 20-hour, 24-hour fast, probably a good thing. Doing extreme workouts and only eating one meal a day, et cetera, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's an extreme and generally the body, the human body is good at handling extremes, but when extremes are done for too long, something ends up kind of breaking and defaulting. So if we look at every health fad that has come along the last 20, 30 years, generally hindsight's pretty clear that yeah, there are some benefits perhaps, but taking it to the extreme, not a good idea. Um, Bill, I'm going to get back to Bill. He might not even be here. In your experience, beneficial topics to reflect or avoid half hour to promote better sleep. Cool. Stop staring at screens. Like if we're on a Netflix binge, like we just finished watching Ozark. So stressful. I cannot go to sleep after watching Ozark because it's, it's too mentally, emotionally stressful and staring at screens. Like, so there's, there is blue light the way your brain interprets it, it does alter melatonin production. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that was the word I couldn't think of earlier. It alters that in circadian rhythms. Biggest thing, don't stare at screens uh, before bed. I sleep best, I can't sleep on a full stomach. So I try to have dinner like two or three hours before I go to sleep. Otherwise I just don't sleep well. For other people, they need a little snack to go to sleep because it helps with blood sugar regulation. Biggest thing, do something chill, don't watch TV, do some stretching, do some chill breathing, put on some essential oil like diffuser, calm down, read some fiction, something that's relaxing and calming. 
probably the biggest benefit and the blue light thing is huge. Um, Mel, I think that's it. I think that's questions. Yeah, I, so, think, I, think you, I think you answered them all and I'm sure people have a lot after the fact. They're probably going to start thinking about this a little bit more and come on up. I would get in touch. Like, I get, again, that was kind of just a rough overview, but I think I just wanted to give people insight and kind of a different lens to maybe go after things. Because, um, you know, this whole health journey, it's just us figuring out what works for us. And I'm just trying to give people a different, more clear lens to figure out, yeah, that makes sense. No, that doesn't make sense. Maybe I'll try this. So there will be questions. Everybody feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to to lend further insight in any way possible. Thank you, Chris, we appreciate that. And just to touch to, uh, one more point on the breath hold question. It, actually, we have um, on Monday, we're offering a course on breath holding with Ricardo Taviera, who works with uh, eco, Hawaii Eco Divers. And he's gonna do a webinar for all of our members on this coming Monday. So that Thank one's, you. everybody's looking forward to that one as well. It's super good. Like I've worked with some really, really big time free dive instructors and it's breath work is awesome and more people are becoming accustomed to it and I think more people should experience especially as a surfer I think everybody watching ourselves included like we all have some near drowning experience all of us if you haven't yet you will and so I think you know in this journey is surfing progression bigger surf charging a bit more, the breath work becomes really relevant because it's just mental confidence. A lot of it is as well. So yeah, that'd be, that'd be cool. That'd be super cool. I agree. Well, thank you so much. We won't keep you any longer. I know you have, a, you're starting your day over there in Australia and we're all getting ready to go to bed over here. Um, but that was so much, so much information, but so much great information. So I think, um, you know, I've done a couple of your workouts already on the app and I love them. And uh, I think everybody on here is, is going to be, I think you, you've sparked their interest. And I see a lot of in the chats, there's a lot of, a lot of thank yous, a lot of I enjoyed it. They learned a lot. So really, Chris, thank you for giving us your time, a lot of time and your experience. I appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, again, like I can't stress the fact anybody reach out. And if anybody is financially tight, reach out. Happy to accommodate even further if you want any programs in the app or something. And uh, yeah. Yes, and thank you for the discount for ESA. We really appreciate that. That's awesome. Cool. And hopefully we'll have you back another time and do this again because I know there's a lot more information and you could probably go in depth even more. Happy so. to. Hopefully we will see everybody on Monday night at uh, 7 p.m for breath hold and tomorrow night on our talking stories we are with uh matt keckley so oh, east coast cool. legend matt keckley surfboard he would now. Wild. i know isn't that cool we're so excited to have him on yeah. um so hopefully everybody can tune in for that and we will say good night to everybody and chris thanks again and we'll talk to you end meeting for all